All right, hello everybody. My name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program, A Child's Journey Through Grief. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask the audience members please silence or turn off their, their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. Our next program, What Social Movements Can and Cannot Do, presented in partnership with Smart Towns, will be an in-person event on Tuesday, November 29th at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. And now, without further ado, please welcome our presenters, Peggy Nielsen and Leah Bengel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Peggy. Um, I am the program manager for St. Castle's Grief Support Program through Henry Ford Health, and this is Leah. Leah is one of our clinical coordinators, and she's actually going to share her story a little bit later, so we'll save that. Um, but she is new to our team, so this is the first time I've actually had the first time to officially present with her. So we're excited to have her as part of our team. And we are here to talk about kids and grief. So this is a... we're. We're here for you to answer any of your questions. We're gonna give you a lot of information. This is like packed full of a lot of information. Um, and if you have questions or anything, please feel free to ask. This is really like a learning together. Sometimes I learn you know, a, a ton from your experience as well as, as you share those things. So, but we're going to start just with a quick question so I can know who is in the audience. So, um, are you here representing a family with a family or close friend of a grieving child to learn about that experience? Raise your hand if you are. Okay, a couple. Are you here as someone who works with children and wants to be better knowledgeable about helping kids? Okay. All right, and then one, and you can pass. We have a rule at St. Castles. You can pass if you're not comfortable answering the question, but just a did you yourself have what you would consider a significant death loss before you turned 18? Okay, what about 25? Okay, a couple. All right. I'm going to talk about stats, <laughs> which is why I kind of am always curious about, well, A, thank you for sharing uh, so we know who's in the audience and we can kind of help um, in any way that way. So we're going to start with just a little bit about the need related if you want, I'll like pull up the video. So Judy's House is a program um, out of uh, Colorado. Actually, Long overlooked. Child. <laughs> Not yet. Actually started, I don't know if any of you were at one point or are Michigan, University of Michigan fans and know the name Brian Greasy. Okay, so Brian, Brian's mom died when he was 14 and he met his wife, Brooke, who is also from Michigan and they ended up in Colorado. But together, she is a clinical psychologist and together they started Judy's house um, in honor of his mother who died. And they are uh, amazingly wonderful program and leaders in the field. Um, also very well funded, so they have lots of arms to be able to do things. And one of their arms is a research arm. So they've been doing research. Um, there is not a whole lot of research out there in the field of children and grief because the field itself is not that old. The first program started, the first program in the country started 40 years ago. So if you think of the, the length of most fields of things, it's, it's relatively new. And that was one program in Portland, Oregon called the Dougie Center. So there are, me, there are more now, but it is a new field. And the research now is starting to come out more and more. So this is research that they did through the um, JAG Institute. And it is called the CBEM, the Children's Bereavement Estimation Model. So just a little bit about uh, the need. So. Childhood bereavement is a critical issue nationwide. According to the Childhood Bereavement Estimation Model, or CBEM, one in 13 children in the U.S. will experience the death of a parent or sibling by age 18. This represents an increase of more than 700,000 children since the CBEM was initially developed in 2018. Created by Judy's House JAG Institute, with philanthropic support from New York Life Foundation, the CBEM approximates rates of U.S. children and youth who will experience the death of a parent or sibling by the time they reach adulthood. 
2022 CBEM results are the first to include a complete data set from 2020, giving us an early look at the direct and indirect impacts of the pandemic on childhood bereavement. In recent years, mortality rates for adults ages 27 through 46 increased significantly. Deaths by accidents, homicide, heart disease, diabetes, suicide, and COVID-19 increased the most, leaving many children and families to navigate the difficult realities of grief. Experiencing a significant death during childhood often results in profound stress and adversity that can derail a child's development. However, providing appropriate support to a grieving child can ease the impact and help keep a child's development on track. Now more than ever, access to comprehensive, grief-focused, trauma-informed care and resources is critical for the well-being of every bereaved child. In order to provide this support, we need to know how many children are grieving. According to 2022 CBEM results, 7.7% of all children in the United States will become bereaved by age 18. That's more than 5.6 million children across the country. And that number more than doubles to over 13.9 million youth by age 25. Childhood bereavement rates vary between the states. Although California has the lowest rate with an estimated 5.9% of children becoming bereaved, this represents more than half a million children. While a staggering 12.4% of children in West Virginia are estimated to experience the tragic loss of a parent or sibling. Every day, you encounter youth journeying through grief in your community. The demand for comprehensive grief care is high, but resources are scarce. By accessing CBEM data and tools, you can elevate childhood bereavement to a critical issue and help every bereaved child find hope and healing. So those numbers are um, national numbers. Um, and as you can tell from that video, childhood bereavement is a critical issue right now in, in our world. Those are the numbers for Michigan actually right now are one in 11. And that they were one in 14 a few years ago. So with the new data that came in from 2020, it is now one in 11. And I anticipate next year when they bring in the 2021 information, um, it's gonna be more. So um, we are here. So thank you for coming, first of all, because it takes a community of just knowing what to do, what to say, what not to do, what not to say, all of that to help and create a grief sensitive community. So thank you, Lindsay, for inviting us and helping us to um, spread the word on grieving children. So I'm going to pass. So our, our goal tonight is to give you a little bit of information about what Sandcastles does. We do have a Rochester program site um, that is actually reopening our in-person programming now um, and um, starting with some some uh, new programming that's coming out in January. So if you are, are or know a family in need, we are happy to be there to help. If you are um, a helping person and want to come volunteer with us, we have a whole volunteer program that you can join. So um, we're going to go a little bit through what we do as a program and then we're going to, and our philosophy, and then we're going to dive into children and grief, the tasks of grief, tools, talking, and all sorts of things like that. So I'm going to pass it to Leah. All right. So what does Sane Castles do to help? So kind of going off what Peggy said, we um, provide support group for ages um, 3 to 18 who have experienced um, a significant death in their life. And with Sane Castles, we are completely free of charge, which is wonderful. We are based off donations and grants, and we are a family-based program. So we are supporting children, teens, and their um, parents and caregivers to help them support them along along this journey and normalize their grief. So being in a group of children or teens who have also experienced death helps them feel less alone in this journey. And we give them the, excuse me, the tools to be able to use at school and in home um, to um, be able to cope with their grief um, into adulthood. So traditionally with Sane Castle, we've been known for our bi-weekly support group, which is a meeting um, twice a month in the community 
where the children, teens, and um, parents and caregivers are divided into groups um, based on the age for the kids and an adult group. And they do, you know, different activities to be able to remember their loved ones as well as learn coping skills to cope with their grief. And this is open to ages 3 to 18. We also, since COVID has started, our virtual program, which is now going to be running um, on Tuesdays in the new year, but now running Tuesdays and Thursdays currently. And Clinton Township, we will be reopening in January doing the biweekly um, peer support group. And our eight-week um, family series, which is new to Sandcastles, which we are super excited about, which will be opening in Rochester um, and West Bloomfield and St. Clair Shores as well. But it's going to be an eight-week course for the children, teens, and families to attend. And um, through this course, they're going to be learning um, kind of like the Grief 101 basics, um, understanding you know, what is grief, understanding our emotions and how to cope with those emotions, as well as um, storytelling, being able to memorialize their person and being able to uh, connect with their family and those around them. Um, the children, again, and teens will be placed in a group and the parents and guardians will be placed in a group um, to learn about children's grief and how to support them um, during that process. And since COVID, we have started our St. Castles Family Community, and these are one-time events that St. Castles has done um, within the community, just a variety of wonderful different activities that um, families are able to come to or come and um, do. I just ran a um, Love Languages one not too long ago, and that was super fun um, to be able to do with the families. And we have our wonderful St. Castles camp. Um, so pre-pandemic, we did an overnight camp um, at uh, Camp Tamarack for grades tw 2 to 12. And it is uh, just such an amazing experience for the kids to come um, for a weekend to be surrounded by other kids um, their age who have experienced um, a death and just seeing that transformation um, over the weekend is really um, undescribable. Um, since COVID, we have done a virtual camp. And then this past year, we got to go back in person at the Howell Nature Center, um, did a um, kind of a hybrid where we started virtual and then did in person for the day and then went um, back to virtual on Sunday. And then for this upcoming year, we're super excited to um, look into different options for day camps, a family camp, and, and going back to our overnight camp. So how to refer a family if you know somebody in need. Um, the parent or guardian would contact St. Castles and um, we would um, you know, give them information about the program um, and schedule them an intake. Um, and during that intake, we just gather basic information about the child and the person that has died as well as how the family is coping. And um, then based on the you know assessment, um, we may refer the child to therapy if needed as well, but additional information can also be found on our website. So if you know of anybody in need, definitely have them call us. And talking about therapy versus counseling. So grief is a natural, you know, response to, you know, death. And with those supports, um, we are able to, um, you know, cope. And so, with traumatic death, you may, you know, need additional support such as therapy. And with therapy, you are able to work through that trauma before working through the grief. So with, you know, traumatic death, it's important to work through that trauma and then you are able to work through our grief. So we sometimes have families that need to start in therapy and then come to St. Castles or sometimes they start in St. Castles or maybe they need a little bit of both. So everybody grieves differently and we support that and um, wanna make sure we're supporting the children as best we can as well. And grief consult calls. Um, I tell Peggy this is one of my favorite things to do is we have people call from the community whether they're a parent, grandparent, uh, teacher, school counselor, and they call and just get um, information about how to support a grieving child in their life. And so um, I did a call not too long ago with a mom 
um, who had a family member die by suicide, and I was able to walk her through how to explain that to her children um, and give her the resources and um, even invite her, you know, to stay in castles if that's something that she was interested in. So that's something that we do that anybody is able to call in the community, and if they were interested in seeing Castle's support group, um, then we would have the parent or guardian call us to schedule that intake. And community education, something we're doing right now, educating the, on the community about children's grief and how to support grieving children in your life. Um, we find that, you know, a lot of people aren't educated on children's grief. You'd be surprised, you know, you would think like doctors and teachers and all the people working with kids uh, would know about this, but it's very under, you know, represented in the community. So that's why we're here to um, educate everyone like you to spread the word and um, just providing different education throughout the community. Okay, so that's our St. Castle story. Um, we are here if you need us. Um, and so now let's turn a little bit, we're gonna talk about our philosophy and that's because kind of it's the ground or the foundation upon which we build all of our information around grief. So we're gonna go through our St. Castle's philosophy. The first is that grief is a natural reaction to a death loss or any kind of loss in children, teens, and adults and some say dogs and cats and anybody who loves and misses. So what that means is it is a nat we have within ourselves the ability to walk that grief journey. Um, it's kind of born with us. It doesn't speak to how hard it is or anything like that, but we have that. So when you love and you lose, you grieve, it is a natural reaction response. So within each of us is, oh, I just said like that, natural capacity to heal oneself. So. Um, this is part of the reason why we are a support program versus a therapy program, because the belief around grief is that we have the tools, given the environment, the support, you know, good coping skills, difference like that, we have the ability to walk that journey through grief and get to a better place in that. It does not require treatment or meds or anything like that. It doesn't require that. Now that being said, like Leah said, there are situations, depending on the circumstances that the families come to us with, if they've experienced a trauma, for example, where for, like maybe someone was killed in front of someone else, for example, which is, is creating a trauma for that child, you do have to do trauma therapy first before you can do grief therapy. You have to work through the trauma of it and deal with that, which does require therapy before you can deal the grief, which can be helped very much in support. We're gonna talk about that. Um, the duration and expression and intensity of grief is unique for every single individual on earth. Even twins are nothing. I had twins in my group once and they were nothing alike in their grief experience. So it's, think of a, your fingerprint or a snowflake. Um, how you grieve is gonna be just unique to about a billion things about you. So how the duration, how long that grief experience is, or really how long the, the, the different parts of it or how strong you feel it is, is gonna be unique to every situation. The expression, how I communicate and how I work through and express my grief. Some kids or adults are like really good with words and I can talk it through and I can tell you everything I'm feeling. I've had kids in groups who don't talk at all, they just come and they listen and that's perfectly fine. I had a, little, uh, a young boy who at the end of every group grabbed the colored pencils and just did it through art, created these amazing pieces of art at the end of every session. And he, not, he didn't, for a year he was in our program and said very, like he was friendly and said hi, but he never shared his story. And at the end of that year, his art piece in one of the groups became it was a picture of a house fire. And it was the story of how his person died. And then he shared that story once, one time in over a year. But he did exactly what he needed to do and he did it exactly how he needed to do it. So we honor that uniqueness and that everyone's manner of expression is, up, is individual. And so we try at St. Castles to provide lots of different opportunities. We do art, we do music, we do drama, we do all sorts of different things. The intensity, so how deeply you feel it, um, everything is unique to the individual. And it's gonna, it's, there's a whole list, like who was it who died? What was the relationship? Um, how, 
how close were you? How old were they? What, how did they die? Was it an anticipated or not anticipated? Was it sudden? Um, was it, you know, what are the coping skills of the person or the child pre the death? You know, are they really great and have their coping skills all right, right, ready to go? Or do they really not have very many quite yet? Um, how old are they? A young three-year-old is going to have a completely different experience because they're concrete thinkers. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Than a 12-year-old. So the duration, expressivity, and intensity is unique. Um, caring and acceptance assist in the healing process, which seems very simple, but it's really important. And because all of us grew up in different homes with different experiences. So even in our volunteer training, we talk about what did we learn about grief when we were kids? Did you live in a house that, oh, like someone, if someone died, there's, there are some houses that the person dies and nobody talks about it after they die. It's just like they're gone and then just gone and there's no discussion. And, and that, for whatever reason, that's the way the family copes. But it also teaches the kids then you can't talk about it. Um, and other, you know, so there's a lot of different things. We know that being able to talk about it and process it is vital to getting through that or getting along that journey. So that idea of caring and acceptance is huge. Our society isn't the best with grief. <laughs> um, you get three days, four days off of work if something significant happens, and then you go back to work, and you know you have some people who might be able to help you or support you, and then you have other people who are like, okay, get back to work. You have a job to do, which is the same for a kid in the classroom, right? So, so it's it's like no one. It, I feel like we are kind of hindered in our ability to deal with grief as a society. Um, as a matter of fact, New York Life, which is one of the big funders of um, the CBA, New York Life Insurance Company has a arm, a foundation arm, and they are huge funders in children in grief. They decided, I don't know, about 10 years ago that they do life insurance, and consequently that is a really good fit, and this field needed some help, and, and became huge funders of us. And so... Um, about, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 years of working with us. And I listened to their vice president of the foundation at, on a conference the other day. And she said, we finally realized that here we are teaching grief, saying we need to honor grief. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to do all this stuff. And we had a four day bereavement leave. So we realized we had to clean up our own act so we could be a role model for others. And they now have a completely different bereavement leave. It's like 15 days off. You can take whenever you need it. It doesn't have to be immediately afterwards. It could be three months afterwards if you want to fly to Florida and, and do a memorial and do ashes there. And they expanded it out. So you, it's not just uh, mom, uh, you know, mother, father, brother, sister, first close family member. Now it's anyone you deem significant. So I don't know all the details of how they put that in, but I was blown away that they made that change. But that's a fantastic step in the right direction. So, okay. So I just talked about this. So societal needs a better, I keep jumping myself. Okay, society needs a better understanding. Go back one second. This is part of the stuff that came from the CBOM, and we have so much. I'm going to just kind of leave that there. These We're going to send out these or have available to you the PowerPoint if you want to look at it. But it talks about the natural um, progression of healthy development in kids and what happens when grief um, affects it and kind of disrupts that development. So by us providing that grief care protective factors, we can push that up and create a better healthy and, um, development versus things going askew if grief is left unaddressed. And the last part is grief. Um, children, teens, and families can help themselves and each other facilitate grief. So we are a peer support program, which means that part of the main element of this is putting kids together in groups with other kids who've had a death or a grief and a loss. And though all everyone's unique, it's powerful to see kids come together with others because they don't necessarily, they're not talking about it in school. They don't necessarily have classmates who've had the same experience. I had one child join our program, her mom, um, they moved back into the state to be, after the father died, to be um, near family. And when she moved back into the state, she told everyone that her, her dad and her mom and dad were divorced. She did not tell anyone that they had died. 
and it took a year before she was ready to disclose to her best friend that her dad actually had died. Then that she did that because it, she knew from her where she had lived before, when you tell someone that your dad died, they treat you different, and they don't know what to say, and they don't know how to act, and it's horrible and it's uncomfortable. So here she took, she was 11, I think, at the time. She took it into her own hands, and she just said divorce, and no one questioned a thing. No one looked at her strange or cross-eyed or didn't know how to talk to her. It was, like, perfectly acceptable. And it took her a long time before she was able to share that. We don't really want that to happen. We want to create a more grief-sensitive society, but that's why we're at St. Castles. We put kids together in similar age groups. For example, at camp, we took 120 kids to camp every year. The first thing we did was a large opening circle, a 200-person opening circle, because we had about uh, 10 staff and probably 60 volunteers or so, so almost 200 people in a large opening circle with one microphone, and we talked about why we were there. We talked about how everybody who is here has had someone die. So we are all in this together. And then we did, and our opening circle start with, my name is Peggy and my mom died. And so 200 people went around and said their name and who died. And right there in that moment, they all know that they're not alone. They're in a group of people who understand and support. And that is the best first step of anything. All right. All right, so let's talk about the basics of grief. So how do we talk about death? So can somebody shout out, what are some of the euf euphemisms for died? What do you think of? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the ones that are on our slide, you guys just said. So I think that had Kaylee, uh, that she had the, <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> There's the full slide. <laughs> so we have, yes, passed away, kicked the bucket, in a better place, went to sleep, um, expired, left us. So these are all euphemisms for died, but when I'm a kid, let's say I'm like six years old, and I hear somebody um, expired. Well, I think of expired milk. I don't know about you, <laughs> but I think, oh, well, why can't you just go to the store and get a new, new milk or, you know, new dad? Or went to sleep. Um, well, this person went to sleep and w didn't wake up. Does that mean I'm going to go to sleep and won't wake up? And Peggy said, you know, when we were talking the other day, we have a lot of kids that come into our program that have sleep issues because they think they're going to go to sleep and not wake up. So these are very confusing when you're a kid because, you know, as an adult, we know what they mean, but these aren't really concrete words to talk about death and dying. And even in society today, think about video games that you know, when you are playing a video game and you shoot somebody in the video game and they die and then they come back to life, well, you know, that's confusing, right? Or when our phones die, we say, oh, my phone died. Well, you can just recharge your phone and then it comes back to life. Or lingo, I, uh, <laughs> the cool kids these days say, oh, I'm, I'm dead, that's so funny. Like, that's what they say, and you're, you're not dead. That's just funny that it made you laugh so hard that you're rolling on the floor, something like that. So being mindful of the words that we say. And for alternatives with the phone, you could say, oh, I have to um, re-energize my phone, or you know, not saying my phone died. So talking about causes of death. So with St. Castles, we use um, these you know, terms, and with this, it um, fits in with most, most deaths, 99%. So when we talk about very, very, very old, somebody was very, very, very old, and their body, you know, stopped working. They, you know, were 95, they lived a very long life, and their body, you know, stopped working. Or very, very, very sick. Somebody was sick for a very long time in the hospital, um, you know, there's nothing more that, you know, the hospital could do or the doctors could do to, um, 
get them better, or we have very, very, very hurt that their body is no longer able to work because they were just so hurt that their body stopped working. So using that concrete language, especially with younger children, helps them to understand um, death. And what does it mean to be dead? So thinking of these things, can you breathe? Is your blood pumping? Can you think? Can you use your five senses, taste, smell, hear, or see? Can you move? And talking about, you know, heaven, if you believe in heaven, body and spirit, when you're here on earth, your body dies, right? But that doesn't mean that you can't talk to their, you know, spirit and that they are, they can be with you in your heart and you can still talk to them, but they're not going to respond back to you. Okay, so we're going to talk about the three tasks of grief and build on what Leah just said. So the three tasks of grief is kind of a model that we use at St. Castles. There's a number of different models out there, but this is the one that we use that really talks about what kids work on when someone has died, what, the, what they need to work on in their grief. Um, the first is to understand the finality of death, which is a thinking process. The second is to experience the feelings that accompany that which is a feeling, emotional process. And the third is um, uh, to memorialize the deceased and reinvest in life and to move that person from a physical part of your life to a memory part of your life, which is a, kind of like a spiritual process. So there are, so we're gonna start. Um, so number one, and first of all, these are not, it's not like one, two, three, done and out. <laughs> unfortunately. It is like a spaghetti map. Do you know what a spaghetti map is? It just kind of goes all over the place and all sorts of things. So you bounce back and forth. This is also going to be dependent on age. So um, a three-year-old experience, like Leah said. So a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old is a concrete thinker. So have you ever heard of that before? So a concrete thinker, meaning I, I understand what I can see, what I can touch, what I can feel, what I hear, all those concrete senses, that's what I understand. So a baby, how are they learning? They're learning by putting things in their mouth, right? Because I'm learning about my world by mouthing things. I literally am feeling them and mouthing them. You know, they're learning by all of those concrete senses. So when you have a younger child, one of the first tasks that first thing they have to work at is understanding what debt is, which is why the language is so important. So if I, all that, if I'm playing a video game, first of all, you have the kick the bucket, and they're like, well, we played that at school, and now my dad kicked the bucket, what does that mean? So you have that level, and then you move it up to the level of, okay, now we're gonna use the word died, but we are even kind of mixed up about the word died. So how do we correct all of this? And it's, it's, it's A, we try to use good language. So when someone dies, we try to use, we use the word dead and died. That's like the least confusing of any of those things. Um, and we start to educate. So that concrete thinker needs to know what happened, number one. They need to know the truth about what happened. So there's a couple elements in that. The first thing is, um, I need to be able to understand it, which is where the language and understanding what debt is. And if your person died and went to heaven, that can be even confusing. Actually, Leah said that. It can be confusing because heaven is not a place I can come back from. But every a three-year-old doesn't know that, right? Every, they don't understand. That's an abstract concept, meaning I can't go there and come back. So a three-year-old may every day say, okay, when is daddy coming home? Because he left before, and he went to work, and he always came back. And, and they're just not quite grasping those things yet. So it takes them a little bit of time to grasp that. And the importance of knowing what happened and learning these tools and using books and resources like we use um, when dinosaurs die. We just brought a couple over here. When dinosaurs die is a great resource for this task, right? So these, this literally goes through. You're welcome to look at it. It goes through how people die and why people die. What does it mean to be alive? So if you figure out what it means to be alive, you go to the opposite and you figure out what it means to be dead. You know, your heart doesn't beat, your lungs don't, you can't breathe. That's the concrete level of discussion we're starting with the young kids. 
That's what they need to understand first. So if you have opportunities to teach kids this before they need it, for example, the fish, uh, they might need it with a fish. I've seen some fish funerals. So, but the things that happen, or you know, you see somebody on TV and someone dies. So if you have an opportunity when you see something that isn't emotionally attached to them to start to teach them about death and dying and grief and loss and have these conversations when they don't need it, that's great. Um, it is something they have to work on. So as the other element of children want to know what happened is the facts around what happened. So it is important that we use the correct language. It is important that we um, tell the story in an age-appropriate manner, little bit by little bit. If they're younger, you might start with a small bit and then add on, and it might grow and grow. Um, kind of put your basics out there and let them ask questions and kind of go from there. You have to tell the truth. And I know that's hard sometimes. We've worked with families where it's... A, so hard, depending on the circumstances around the death. But it's super, super, super important to tell the truth. Because if you grieve what you know, and if I told you today that someone you love died of a heart attack, and you go to the funeral, you grieve that, you think they had a heart attack, you work on that, and you, you know, assimilate that into your life, and that's okay. And two years from now, I call you up and I tell you, okay, I, they actually died by suicide. And you're an adult, right? So what happens? You have to start that grief process over again because you just changed the game. And now it's a whole different thing. So now I have to re-grieve all of that. And we don't want anyone to have to do that. So we really strongly encourage the truth-telling in the very beginning. And that's like Leah's example of being able, that's call us. Like if, how do you explain we have three different definitions of how to explain suicide to a child that families can kind of choose from. Like, you have options and how what's in your own belief system and things like that. But let's talk that through and let and work on a way that is comfortable for the parent to be able to share that. But sharing that is what's most important. They need to know the factual ever um, factual information, and if they can get it from a loving, caring adult in their world, that is absolute best right? If you're getting news that you don't really want, wouldn't you rather have it from somebody you love who's there to support you? Because the risk is, and what we do sometimes see in groups, is people don't, people underestimate the, this, oddly enough, the, the amount of information that goes outside. So if you don't tell the whole story about whatever it is, people are talking about it outside. Maybe they're talking about it at school or church or in the community, or maybe it shows up on social media as they get older. And the kids will learn things that their parents don't know they know. And I'd much rather have, you know, even as a parent, I would rather be the one giving that information. So it's another layer. The truth is very important. And giving that in a safe environment and with age-appropriate language is probably one of the big things. Leah talked about the word dead being an abstract concept and the challenges with the word dead, so we've already talked about that. This video actually does not work, <laughs> but it's okay. Do you recognize that, anyone? Yeah. Okay, so it's Coyote and Runner, Roadrunner from a bazillion years ago. It's just the opening. It's one minute of the opening to that show. And if you could watch it, my question would be, how many times does he die in that video? <laughs> because a boulder falls on him. But what happens? He gets back up again. I think there's like 12 times that he should be dead in that video, but he gets back up. So it's a silly example. And the other example, the video games, like literally I die all the time in Mario Brothers, but, um, or Mario Kart, but I always can recover. So using the appropriate language and understanding those concepts and the death data bank that kids have, what are the things that they know about the word dead and died, those are really important elements that we need to piece together so we can give a clear, concise explanation of what's going on. Kids will tend to overgeneralize. So uh, for example, we had a child, a young child at program whose person had died in the hospital and his mom, who's bringing him, was pregnant and going to the hospital to have the baby. And this child was <laughs> wanted nothing to do with that. You cannot go to the hospital. Nope, nope, this is where people die. No, you can't. And just super struggling behaviorally, emotionally with that. That is really normal. So what do you do? So we uh, recommended 
this was pre-pandemic, we recommended going to take the hospital too or having the child go to the hospital to see the ward or see the nursery with the babies. Like usually they have some kind of family tour and they did that. And so they just educated him, helped him to understand, helped him to understand that people go to the hospital with all sorts of reasons, right? You go for a hip replacement and you get your hip replacement, you come out, you, you go to have a baby and you bring a baby home. And sometimes you do go when you are very, very sick. Sometimes they can help you and sometimes they can't in, their, in that grandparent's case. So um, those are really normal reactions and it's just about that education, that understanding. Does that make sense? <laughs> Any questions, thoughts, experiences? Okay, hold on to me. There'll be another chance if you want it. And then the grief process is cyclical. So it, it, it doesn't go away. It just kind of keeps going and over. You can flip. I think you have the page on that. It flips and flips and flips. And sometimes um, I started, well, I didn't start my career, but I worked in, uh, at Aaron's house in Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, as their director there many years ago. And Erin was a little girl who was five years old, and she, um, her dad read her a book at night and said, I'll be back in five minutes to um, turn out your light and have you go to sleep. And when he came back, she was dead. And this was a while ago. They never figured out at the time how she died. They just said her heart stopped, which is what happens when you die. <laughs> so, okay. So it was a hard, it was so hard on the family. And actually, Erin's house was founded on Erin's death. So um, it was named after her. But this was actually my first job out of um, my graduate degree. And um, I learned so much from their parents. And her mom had said, you know, I go to bed. She had two younger kids, let me clarify. So Erin was five. She had a three and a one-year-old in the household. And she said, I go to bed, I'm just exhausted, and I, you sleep, and you wake up, and when you wake up, you have those few seconds in the morning that you just don't remember, you know, you just, you're kind of in that fog. I, it happened to me this morning, I thought it was Wednesday. I literally got up and said to my son, don't you have class? <laughs> He's like, it's, it's Thursday. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, but she's like, you got those few seconds where you're just very fuzzy, she said, and then I would reach a point where I remembered and I woke up and I remembered that she died. And every single morning, it was a ton of bricks hitting me. Every single morning. I couldn't get out of bed. I didn't want to take a shower. I, I knew that I needed to take care of my kids. My kids needed me. They were grieving. And I'm their mother. I should be able to take care of them. And I can't get myself out of bed in the morning. And that happened repeatedly and repeatedly, which is the great part of having resources or other people in your life who can come and help um, or programs that you can take them to, to to get help. But so it's very cyclical, and it could be on a daily basis. It can be on a, it's just kind of, Leah will talk about it later, like it's a lifelong basis of different events. It might be the holidays coming up, right? If you're, you had someone die in the last year, and this is your first Thanksgiving, or maybe it's your second Thanksgiving, which is as challenging as your first sometimes, because it's different and a little more real. And so all the different elements of what they have to go through in the cyclical process of this, you also will get it developmentally for kids. So that three-year-old who's a concrete thinker, when they hit different developmental stages and a an different developmental understanding of my mom died and she's not coming back, will re-grieve at those developmental stages. We actually had a child who was in our program as a five-year-old, and I got a call back um, when he was going into high school or middle school, like maybe it was eighth grade, and he wanted to come back to program. And he himself, that child, recognized, I got everything I needed at the time when I was little, you know, helped me to get through it there, but now I'm in a different phase. I'm like becoming a man in a different phase and I have a different understanding and now I'm grieving in a new way. Like I was so in awe of him that he had that realization and he asked for help. So you will grieve, grieve, and it'll go on through life when you get married or when you have children or when you reach the age that your parent was when they died, which I'm going to give a caveat. They said it in the video, but just in case you didn't catch that, that one in 11 is parent or sibling death. So one in 11 kids will experience the death of a parent or sibling before they turn 18. That number doubles by 25. That does not count for aunt, uncle, grandparent loss, especially all the grandparents who are taking care of or raising kids, um, brother, sister, best friend. For us, 
it's, it's a little bit under 75% of our program families have a, a parent or a sibling loss. Um, the t other 25% have other people. So that number of grieving children that are out there is way higher even than that video shows, if you take that into consideration. Okay, so what helps work on this task, this task that is this thinking task and understanding what debt is? One, having some time where you talk about it. We say a circle time, we have a circle time at Sandcastles, they come every two weeks. Um, and in our biweekly program, and they talk about it. I know I'm coming to Sandcastles to talk about it. Um, and I can, it's a safe place, I can do that. Or we've had families that have closed from Sandcastles and decided that they were gonna keep up, we, have, we used to have pizza every single time, and <laughs> with a lot of pizza. So we'd have pizza and then program. And so this family actually closed and said, we're still gonna do Tuesday night pizza. We're gonna pizza and then we're gonna talk about grandpa who died. So they kept that circle time and that family time going even after they closed from our program. Talking when the kids want to and respecting their wish not to talk at a particular time. So this is something if you ever do like a top 10 things teens want the adults to know about their grief, this always shows up on a top 10 list. They say, my parent came in and sat down at, you know, because they got home from work and they decided like six o'clock on Thursday night was the time they're going to have this big heart to heart talk with me. And I had just gotten home and I had homework and da, 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 and I just had no desire. Like, why do they think that? They're trying, right? They're trying and they're trying to figure it out because we're all trying. And, but the, t the teen is, but then what will happen is you'll find a teenager, my daughter's done this to me. It's like, 12.30 at night and I go in to say good night and then she's blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. And I know it's really important and I need to stay awake and I need to focus, I'm exhausted. You have to catch them when they're ready, especially the older kids, right? When they're in that spot, regardless of what time it is or what you got going on, if you absolutely can't do it at that point in time, say, I'm so glad you're talking to me and I really wanna hear what you have to say. I do have to do this but I'll be gone for an hour, and when I get back, I'd love to continue this conversation. So honor, respect, like show that you are interested and then allow, them, allow that conversation to continue. Okay, children should be included in the dying process and in what happens afterwards. I worked for a year in pediatric hospice and watching, um, working with families where there was a child who was dying and siblings in the household. So one of the things that we would do would be try to, help, actually, we talked about these three tasks of grief with the parents, about what to expect, because as you have someone who's dying in your house or your family, the ability to do some anticipatory grief work, which is say the things that you want to say, or have that opportunity to say goodbye in a healthy way, is a really wonderful thing. And it's one of the, it's a wonderful, one major wonderful elef elephant element of the hospice programs, right? So they can create those things, a, a lot of, other good things about hospice programs. But including them as much as possible, making sure that they're aware of what's happening. We had a family where there was a young girl who was dying who had two brothers. And um, when we came in, the family wasn't talking about it very much. I mean, it was kind of obvious. It was like the elephant in the room. But she had been sick for a long time, and they weren't really talking about what needed to be happening. So we were really like blessed and happy to be able to say let's let's talk about this let's figure out how to talk about this as a family and and what are the steps you're going to take and what do they need to know so having that empowers kids now on the flip side i had a child in program that their parent did not tell them everything about the death this child was 11 um there had been multiple deaths in their family um and he found out by hearing someone talk about it when they were talking on the phone and he didn't tell anybody that he had heard that overheard his parent talking but he found out information he did not know and I cannot tell you how angry he was about it so here he's sitting in a group his parent does not know that he knows this more or less that he heard it by hearing him on the phone but he's angry and it was just like one more thing that he had to work through on top of the horrific loss that he had so the more that we can create that environment and do the hard 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 work that it is um to kind of process these things and include the kids, the better. And even in the funeral and that component. So if you're ever taking a child into a funeral home, um, my brother will joke with me. He's like, oh, you've been in this field for 25 years. You must love going to funerals. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> Who loves going to funerals? 
I don't know what you're thinking. And he's like, well, you got to know the right things to say. I'm like, yeah, no, not really barely because there really is no right thing to say. It depends on the person, you know? Some people appreciate that I'm sorry. I'm really sorry for your loss. And other people are like, I don't want to hear that. Don't be sorry. Don't feel guilty. I've had a teenager say that. We asked that question in a teen group. He's like, I don't want you to tell me I'm sorry. You're sorry. That's just pity. I don't want your pity. So I usually go with something like, I, I'm here for you. I love you. I'm here if you need me. You know, something just compassionate. Um, the more we can help these kids walking in, the better. So if you have a young child who's walking into a funeral home for the first time, tell them what it's about. Explain that it's a very long, it's a big room with a lot of couches but no tables. You know, and people stand. Nobody, like not many people sit, stand in the middle. And at one end, there's a, a casket. If, and the you know your the person's body will be in the casket and and you know this is the clothes we chose or whatever we've got all sorts of things like kids don't why what, they ask questions like did they cut their legs off like why can you only see half do they have pants on do they have shoes on or when you close the casket does it smush their face really concrete questions right these actually are good questions right and the answer to that is no. There's a little thing on the side that they roll it down and the whole thing flattens and nobody's fits. But, but encouraging families, if you have, they have those questions, just ask your funeral directors are wonderful and just ask for the kids to be able to go in and have that question. Or have a child come in before the rest of the family so they can kind of see that. And the value of that, if you think about this, if we go back to the concreteness of understanding what that is, and the fact, as Leah had talked about, that the body you can no longer see, feel, hear, right? When you're in a funeral home and looking at a body, what are you seeing? I know, it's creepy. But you are seeing a body that is not moving. If you touch it, it's cold. There's no heart beating. There's no breathing there's no feeling pain which could be comfort to some to a child or a or a bereaved because the person may have been in pain a lot and now they're not feeling pain so there's something very concrete which is actually going to help on this task now of not everybody does an open casket so but those are elements of it that can play into this repetition helps i'm sorry i got three more I already talked about telling the truth. Repetition helps. Kids need repeating. We had a family that actually the little girl, her mom died, asked the father every day for three months when mom was coming home. And he'd say, exhausted, he'd say, okay, well, we talked about this yesterday. Do you remember the conversation? <laughs> She's like, I don't understand. So she, it, it, they started with some very basic mom died, you know, she, and, and she, her spirit went to heaven, you know, and, and she's not coming home. And then he, it, well, so how did she die? And then sooner or later he started to explain, well, she died of cancer. Well, what is cancer? So he had to explain what cancer is and the tumor and the cells in the body. And then, okay, so, and how that works. And every day she asked like a little bit more of questions, like a little deeper questions and a little understanding. As she started to understand that first part, she could go a little deeper into the conversation. And so in the end, she actually said, okay, so if mom's, if mom, you know, got sick and had cancer, and then the cancer killed her body. Where is her body now? And they had cremated her, so he was not, that's when he called the center to figure out, what do you say to that? Um, but they worked him through. They worked that through with him and actually gave him the resources, and the, you talked about what happened in a crematorium, and there's great books on it and resources. You can call your, well, back then, you called your, they got help from the funeral director to kind of explain that and go through that. So they literally do to the point she said, okay, so now I understand all this. Where's mom now? Where's mom's ashes? And they went over to grandma's and took the ashes down and opened them up. And the little girl literally ran her fingers through the ashes and, and was like, okay, okay. It took months of work and daily questions, but she got to that understanding. And that's kind of where you get. So you have to tell the truth. You have to be patient, understand that, and always remember that children learn from adults. Like I talked about in the beginning, if you're a house that, or you grew up in a house that didn't talk about death, someone died, and they just never talked about the person again, the kids are learning from us. So what we do is what's okay for them to do. If I'm 
talking about my grief, talking about my emotions, showing how, yes, I got really frustrated and that I'm sorry and I'm, I'm owning my frustration and I need to go do something. I'm going to go take a walk so I can get this outside of my body. I'm now teaching my child that I can be frustrated. I need, I, we're, Leah's going to talk about that next. And I can go take care of that and do that. That's like a healthy coping skill. But if I get frustrated, blow up and walk away and never talk about that, I'm teaching the child something else. So we have to remember that they learned from us. And we need to take care of ourselves in order to do that. All right. You know, there is, you got the clicker? It's funny you walking back come. and forth, yeah. <laughs> OK, so feel the feelings. Um, so this is a very, you know, emotional process. And grief, grief affects our psyche. So this affects many things our mind our body our soul it affects us um, as a whole and so with kids movement um, and play are the language of grief so you may see you know a child playing right after somebody dies and you're like well why aren't you know they crying well that's how you know children work through their grief is through play and movement so uh, that's important to be able to give those opportunities um, for play and movement and exercise. Um, and it's normal to use our defense mechanisms. Peggy, I'll have you explain that one because you do it so much better than I do. <laughs> okay. So we talk about, um, in general, if I'm going to like stick them into three, kids will have like three types of defense mechanisms that they can use. And they're safety, so you don't want to pull their defense mechanisms away without having something to replace them. But you see kind of coming into our programs one of three cases. One is the child who will start to act out after a death occurs. They're getting in trouble in school. Or they punch somebody for the first time. You know, they're not turning in their homework. They're like acting out, which is a, a normal response right? Something happened in their life that they were, that they couldn't do anything about, and now they're just angry and trying to control and let that anger out. Those are the kids who show up at our program first, because they're the first ones to be identified as that child needs help, that child's grieving, and it needs help. And the question to always ask is, what was the behavior like before the death? So now if this child was acting out and beating kids up before the death, it's a little bit of, still an issue, but a different issue, right? If they weren't doing that before the death, and now they are, then you know it's because of the grief for sure. The second type is the child who will withdraw. Get kids who just stop talking to people. They stay in their bedroom. They don't want to participate in, in you know, anything. They just want to be by themselves and kind of go internal. Very normal reaction. Um, these are probably the next set of kids that will come to us, right? My kid doesn't want to talk. I don't know if they're going to talk in group. That's okay. They don't have to talk in group. But we know they're here. And they hear what's happening, and they hear that other people are going through the same thing, and they learn from them. So it's okay. They don't have to talk. But that element is like the second one. Um, the third one would be that they're the child who becomes perfect. I don't want to make my mom any more sad or any more mad than she is, so I'm going to do everything right and perfectly. And now I'm going to score 35 points in the basketball game, and I'm going to get all A's. And what's going to happen? Everyone is going to praise me, and my mom's going to be happy. I'm not, you know, everything. But the reality is, those kids are still grieving, and they're hiding it. So those kids need the help just as much. They don't have to be perfect. So those are some of the like, examples of defense tools that kids will go in that we want to work with and the ones that we see. So all of them are normal. Thank you. <laughs> and um, kind of going off that, so children often feel responsible for the death. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my story in a little bit, but, um, you know, my mom died and I thought, well, maybe if I would have called her or that day, then maybe, you know, she wouldn't have died or if I would have done this. So, um, it's important that, you know, as parents and caregivers and those in the community that we not only, you know, let the children express how they're feeling, but also remind them that they, you know, are not responsible for what happened and they are very loved. And grief is physical, which I will talk about on the next slide, but going off the suppressing your feeling versus feeling your feelings, it's important to feel our feelings and that it's not going to feel this way forever. 
and um, to work through this. And if we suppress our feelings and we're just kind of bottling it up and then it's all going to come out at once and um, we don't want that. So we want to work through our feelings um, and feel them. So how does our body react to grief? So there's a lot of different words on this slide, but, you know, just a couple examples, you know, you might get headaches or fatigue or weight loss or weight gain, difficulty sleeping. There's lots of different ways that we can feel grief in our body, and there's no right way. Everyone is different as far as how they grieve and how their body reacts to grief. So basic needs of children and adults, too. So things that we need all need to cope with these difficult emotions. So we have care. So like I mentioned, we need to know that there's people around us that care about us. So whether that's your parents or your grandparents, aunt and uncles, friends, teachers, we need to know that we have people that care about us around us. Um, feelings, we wanna understand our own feelings, be, being able to identify them and work through them. And then, you know, going through expression, talking about these feelings. Well, how am I going to work through these feelings? Say I'm really, really angry. Am I going to go and punch somebody or am I going to go rip up a bunch of tissue paper? Different ways to be able to express our grief in healthy ways. And lastly is support. So, you know, being cared that you know you're cared for is that you have your um, support system in a not judgeable, du uh, <laughs> judgmental environment, whether that's, you know, coming to sane castles or school or at home being able to talk and feel supported. Okay, and managing these difficult emotions. Um, there's no right or wrong way to feel. I can feel really, really angry about the death, or I could feel sad, or I could feel relief. There's no right or wrong way, you know, to feel, but they, the important thing is, is, you know, how we release them um, in working with those emotions. Like, again, not, you know, punch, punching somebody and ripping up tissue paper instead, being able to get out that um, grief in physical ways as well. So what helps? Um, listening, accepting, and caring. Being able to provide that safe environment um, for the child or teen to be able to express their grief um, and listening to them. Um, and I know I'm skipping ahead, but reflecting back what they're saying. So, you know, I'm feeling really sad today. Oh, you're feeling really sad today? Yeah, I just had a really bad day. You had a bad day? Yeah. So going, you know, being able to reflect what the child is saying or doing and that, you know, can be exactly what they're doing. They're playing with Legos or those types of things. And physical expression, you know, we provide different ways for the kids and teens to be able to express their grief during group. So maybe that's through arts and crafts or games or jumping jacks. We had like a dance party the other time. It was awesome. <laughs> so um, being able to express your grief in many ways. Lowering expectations. So Peggy talked about this. We don't, you know, expect a child to go back to school four days after the death and be able to function how they were before. So lowering those expectations, making sure your, grie or your school is grief informed and being able to um, talk to the school staff about the death and um, we actually on some of the resources that we have we have a um, link to uh, individualized bereavement plan that the school can um, create with you know the parent or guardian to be able to help um, the child you know not only this first year but the years coming because um, grief doesn't just end at one year um, it can it's a you know a lifetime experience and again, reassuring the child that the death was not um, their fault and referring to therapy as needed if it's a uh, traumatic death or um, a little additional support is good as well. Okay, so the third process or the third task is to go on living and loving after the person has died and memorializing. As I said, it's a, it's a process of moving them from a physical part of your life to a memory part. 
Um, and it's a faith process. So there are different ways to kind of come to terms with the death. Everyone has their unique journey. Um, one of the ways we look at this is sometimes when something, someone first dies, it, you start out just asking the why question. Why did that happen? Why? Why did it happen to them? Why did it have to happen at all? Why did it happen to me? And a lot of questioning around why. And as time goes on and grief processing goes on, you kind of move to that question of, okay, what can I do about it now? So this happened, like, so what do I do and how do I do that? And that can be both like physical things, like how do I run my household, you know, and I have one less adult here, so how do I get the kids to school in the morning or how, you know, some very concrete things. It's also a lot of emotional things, like how do I deal with this? And then it will move to how am I going to do it and really putting together those plans of how to do that. It's, flip to the next slide for a second. I want to talk about that. So, does anyone did anyone watch WandaVision? All oh, right. Okay, I'll probably hack this story, but like, bear with me. So, I know. I know. Well, that was intent. I think they intended that. <laughs> me too. And what was going on? I think, in conclusion, now that I watched the end of it, was Wanda has all sorts of mystical powers and can control time and space, kind of, right? And she, at, in a different movie, was married to Vision, <laughs> who is a solo, hum, solo super person, right? He's by himself. He doesn't have family. He doesn't have any connection. But they fall in love, and he dies because it's Marvel, and it's a movie. And he, I think, he, does he sacrifice his life for the world to be saved? A good summary? Okay, good summary. So they did this re-up of this, and it was like an eight-week series, and it's called WandaVision. And Wanda has... in they piece it together so you really don't know what's happening until you watch several of them. But Wanda has created an alternate universe of sorts where she brings Vision back and now they're married. And she's living through them getting married and their life and then they have children and then the kids are getting older. Well, in, rea in the reality, outside of the bubble, which was literally a bubble, um, the rest of the world is like, what's happening in this town? Because she happened to take over a town and people and kind of their minds. So that's a side note. But <laughs> there is a point to this. So, <laughs> so she is, in essence, her grief of this loss and her ability or lack of ability to be able to cope with this has created this, where she has taken over people's lives and she is creating this environment that she wishes were here but isn't here. And so in reality, the world's pounding it down and is about to knock it out and say, you can't do this anymore. And so this video clip, if you could see it, is a beautiful little piece between them. And she's like, I just don't. They're about that the whole thing is going to come down. He's going to go away because he doesn't actually exist. And she's going to be left behind in grief again. No kids, no husband, no nothing. This world that she really wanted but didn't happen. And so he's talking to her and he is saying, She's like, I just don't think I can deal with it. I don't think I can handle the grief. And he's like, but you can. Because in essence, he's like, I was alone and I didn't know. And then when you know love, you always have the love. Not, he's in essence saying, not even death can take away that love. And the quote that he says is, what is grief if not love persevering? So it's, it, it's a, beautiful you, when you get the powerpoint hopefully you can push the button <laughs> and listen to it but it's a beautiful little marvel moment of really talking about the power of grief and the importance of it and what is grief if not love persevering like we are grieving because we love so grief is in essence i say to sometimes when people are crying don't apologize a tears release stress hormones so it's healthy to cry because that kind of tear, you're cleaning out things in your body you don't need, right? That's cry, cry away. And two, it 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 death it, it doesn't take away love. That love is there forever, and that's why as we go on and in this three third task, move that person from a physical part of your life to a memory. There's a whole lot of work writing out there and continuing bonds and continuing the relationship with the person, not physically, they're not here, but still carrying that and the things they learn. So we'll have sometimes um, activities at program of what did you learn from your person? What, did, what gifts did your person give you that you have? No one's gonna take that away, not even death. 
So that's kind of the third, that's parts of the elements of the third task. Can you go back one? Oh, and allow a timeout for grief. So there are times when families, you have this idea that, um, actually it's, a, it's the same thing. So it's okay to take a time. You can flip to the next one. Um, allow a, a timeout. It's okay to take a timeout. It's okay to be sad and in grief, but for the kids to take a trip to Disney World and laugh. You know, that, like that's healthy too. And it's not disrespectful to the person who died. It's healthy and it's okay. Um, other things that help, believe in a return to wellness for the child even when we, then they cannot. I think that's part of the benefit of a peer support group. You have people at different points in time after the death. So some might be just the person died a month ago. Others might be the person died two years ago. And as you get through that grief and are further along, you know that other people will get through it. You can hold on to that hope for them even when they cannot. And that's what we, I guess that's what we do, is we hold on to the hope that they will that they will get through this. Even if they can't see that light, we're gonna hold on to it for them. We celebrate the steps towards healing. Sometimes in group, we'll have someone journal, and they'll journal, and then we'll, they'll write out whatever the question is, and then six months later, we'll give it back to them. And they'll open up that envelope, and they're like, wow, I really came a long way. I didn't realize it until I read this from back then, but I actually really have come a long way. So it's good to celebrate those steps. And be aware of our own grief as helpers. Um, you know, when you're walking into supporting everyone, just, just know that it's important to take care of yourself and honor yourself and do your own work along the way. It makes us better helpers. So we talk a lot about, you know, how to support, you know, your child, but also as the parent, guardian, or others um, in the child's life, it's important to take care of ourselves first. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that come up in life, and it's okay to say no when you need to. No, I, I can't, you know, do this today. I need to, you know, take a moment for myself. Just like when you're on an airplane, you they say, you know, put your oxygen mask on first before putting on others. Um, don't, you know, take things personally if things aren't going your way. And it's important to realize that you come first so that you can help the grieving child in your life. Can I have the clip? Oh, go ahead. I'm going to suggest that we yeah. only, we, so we put a, we, we didn't know how long we talked. So, <laughs> but we put some extra slides in here that we would cover if we have time, but I really want to get to Leah's story because I think that's more powerful. So mindfulness, we all, <laughs> be mindful. Yes. Mindfulness class. Very important. <laughs> so let's skip that. Okay. I'm actually going to skip this. Too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So, um, this little girl right here is me, <laughs> and uh, this is my mom, Laura. So, um, my mom died in 2009 from suicide, and we joined Sand Castles, um, I think, end of, you know, 2009. Um, my aunt found the program. And me, um, my wonderful father, and my uh, younger sister um, attended. And I uh, was 12 years old, and my sister Jacqueline was nine. And 12 years old is a super awkward age. <laughs> um, I was going into middle school that year. Um, summer had just let out. I, um, you know, my mom uh, had struggled with MS, but this was not part of my summer plans. And so the day that my mom died, my uh, dad came to my aunt's house where I was staying for the week and said, you know, mommy went to heaven today. So when we started going to seeing castles, um, nobody in my school had really, you know, experienced a death. Um, and it was pretty safe to say that the school was not prepared um, for a grieving child either. I had one really good counselor, but there's a horrific story about a classroom that I can share another time. But, um, you know, I didn't really have anybody to talk to, and I come from a Sicilian family. My uh, grandma, who we call Nona, is from Sicily. You don't talk about grief. Um, my dad experienced the death of his sister and dad when he was younger, and how they cope with it is they wore black, didn't talk about it, didn't watch TV, you did nothing. You just, you know, sat there and 
mourned. Um, so for my dad to be able to take me and Jacqueline to Sandcastles is pretty impressive because it's definitely one step in the right direction. Um, so at Sandcastles, I was able to relate to other kids, um, be able to talk about my mom. My dad was taught how to talk about my mom with me because you know, that's not something that he was taught from his Sicilian background. Um, with suicide, he was taught how to talk about the truth. As Peggy mentioned earlier, um, especially with like suicide and like homicide, we don't want to talk about the truth. Um, and my dad was very open and honest about any questions that I had, which um, is hard to hear, right? It's hard to process, but it would have been a really lot harder and suckier to find out two years later how she really died if, you know, if I wasn't told the truth. And that, um, with my time at St. Castles, um, you know, it was really transforming. Um, I We only stayed in the program for about two years because then I joined cheer and got busy and all that jazz. Um, but I was able to take the things that I learned from seeing castles and use them into high school. And it was when um, I got to high school that I was like, hey, like I think I want to be a social worker <laughs> and um, be able to help other grieving kids because um, I had this experience and I want to be able to help other kids and be able to help other people and be able to help school teachers like the one that <laughs> I'll tell the quick story I won't go into detail but it was music class eighth grade and we started singing somewhere over the rainbow which is the song that my mom sang to me when I was a baby and of course my natural reaction is to sob because I didn't listen to that song for two years for good reason and the music teacher ran up to me and she's like why are you crying and I was like I'm sorry and she's like go to the counselor's office so at least the counselor was supportive but even with teachers it's important to inform them as well so that's kind of a little bit about my story and how I got here and all because a lady named Peggy started saying castles <laughs> so thank you for um thank you Peggy for starting saying castles and um, my family um who has been a very very big support on this journey and you wouldn't think you know a dad two girls he wouldn't know what to do but he he winged it pretty well so <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> okay, so now you might have caught a couple things where she's like, I love taking grief consult calls, where you might have been like, huh? Oh. Because that call that she took was a family who had a suicide, and she had been that kid, and that, so her, her, it's like totally awesome and bizarre at the same time to have like Leah join our staff having been a child in our program that's like the first like full, it's a full circle moment but what she can offer to families and to you by sharing her story and showing that resilience um, wasn't always you know it's not an easy journey but there are ways to do it well she mentioned doctors teachers my daughter just graduated with a teaching certificate and they did not teach her anything about children and grief except for the fact that she told them that my mom runs a children's grief support. <laughs> and so I did an hour in service for that group of 40 kids <laughs> that graduated from Michigan. Um, and I apparently get to come back this year too, so that's good. So we want to get out there because it's just not part of their curriculum. They have a ton of things to learn in their curriculum, but they don't, it, this isn't in it. New York Life had done been doing a study um, as part of a research project they were doing and talking with, um, I think it was Duke, and the, somehow they had this. There was only five ha medical schools at the time that talked about grief at all to their doctors. And what is grief? Physical, right? Headaches, stomach aches, anxiety. It's all of that. And, and we're, not, we're missing the mark on educating there, too. So, um, so I thank you so much for coming because it is, this is a ground up movement of let's just this information. Did it make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's not hard, but you don't know if you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And now when you know, we, we do differently. So we have resources for you. First of all, um, there's no time to talk about the holidays. So we did this just for a quick moment, but most importantly, I'm gonna say, the bottom one is, we, I just did with Kaylee on our team, um, a webinar called Glitter and Grief. It's on our YouTube page, it's on our Facebook page. It's about an, 
an hour, hour and a half, and it's all about dealing with the holidays, how to cope with the holidays, activities you can do on the holidays. In essence, these are kind of common things. Plan ahead. Families should sit down, talk about it, communicate with their children, plan together. Everyone's going to be on a different page. That's okay. There's no right or wrong. There just is. Some people just leave and go on a vacation the first year, and other people do the exact same thing they've always done. So there's no right or wrong. It's just figuring out what's right for that family and reminding them, or if you're having someone who's grieving, that they can, you can change your mind. You can plan one thing and change your mind at the last minute. It's fine. Um, incorporating your children into conversation and then asking for help. But this is a great webinar. It's out there. If you know of somebody who needs it, you're welcome to do that. Flip that. So there's a few additional resources. I talked about New York Life Foundation. I am not pitching life insurance at all. Okay, this is not. This is nothing about that. I'm not selling life insurance. Um, I am woefully impressed with their foundation and there as a corporate social strategy or social responsibility. Um, and they are a website, a child in grief you can go to. They have oodles and oodles and oodles of resources for you. If you are in the business, they actually you can even get like um, a book called When Families Grieve that they'll give to you for free. You can get like copies of that to hand out. We have it. We mail it to families as needed and lots and lots of resources. And they funded all sorts of things, great projects, speaking grief, all sorts of things that are on there. So keep flipping. Um, the National Alliance for Children's Grief is an organization that we are a member of. This is um, everyone who does our work across the country and actually in a couple other countries um, that are just part of this alliance. And together we have spent 20 years just trying to push forward the field and change things. We have created as an alliance all sorts of wonderful resources. So that individualized bereavement plan that Leah was talking about, there's a whole toolkit for schools. And if you're part of a school and you want to learn more, let us know. We will happy to come and share. There's a whole toolkit about how you can handle, a ch uh, you know, how what administration does and what they can look at, how you can make the grief, the school more grief sensitive, how you come up with this actually individual bereavement plan with a child returning so that you talk all the things through before they walk through. Everything is there. So it, call us if you want more information or check out the website. There's also wonderful resources on um, Grief, how to talk to a child about death, how to incorporate funerals. There's just all sorts of things. You are welcome to check there. If you need something, you're also welcome to reach out to us, and we will get it for you. Lots of wonderful resources. We brought a few books over there if you want to just get some hands-on ones, um, some of our favorites. And on the far side over here, um, if you want to join our mailing list, we have an email list. So our email list, just we do a monthly newsletter full of resources and what's happening at Sandcastles. You're welcome to put your information there, and we'll get that to you. This is what Leah referred to, so it's not electronic. You'll have to type those links in. But if you email us, we'll send you this, so you can just push the button. These are a lot of those resources, um, plus some additional ones. This, I have oodles of, this is our Forever Change book. When we first started, there was like no resource, grief resources out there in the community. So we, we created a workbook. There's activities in here. Um, and I still have tons of them. So just if you want these or can use them, take as many as you want. This is a project Sesame Street did, particularly for kids. It is a DVD, so they are getting a little old. <laughs> It's also online, but there's also like a workbook and things in there. So if you have preschoolers and you're, or young kids, like Sesame Street, Elmo, Elmo's cousin's dad dies. And so they deal with this in true Sesame Street style. It's wonderful. Um, I've actually even used this in a teen group because who doesn't love Elmo? <laughs> and then we have our brochures at the end. And then just questions. Go ahead. Me too. Well, I think, I mean, so for a lot of situations, we say very, very, very sick because, you know, they had an illness in their brain and they just couldn't see a, um, you know, a way out of what they were going through. So I think in that situation, we say very, very, very sick. Anything you want to add to that? No, that was good. There's some research that studied dopamine levels of in the brain of 
after a, a, someone has died by suicide and different things that kind of lead to that, you know, an altered chemical s status in the brain. Um, we, we just did a, the NAGC, which is now the NACG, changed their name last year, I'm getting there, um, just did a special webinar on children's suicide. So they, per, if, you know, if you're interested, they have lots of resources and two additional definitions of suicide that were worded a little different. I was going to say, and did a little podcast with Kaylee about um, supporting um, children, talking about my own experience, but kind of some tips. It's like a 10-minute video, so that's a good one, too. <laughs> that is a good one. That's on our website, and it's on our social media, so it's on our Facebook page. We do Grief and Brief, Kaylee and I do. It's a three to nine minute, <laughs> depending on how much we talk, once a month educational tidbit on something about related to grief. So it shows up on our um on our Facebook page. It also will show up in the newsletter that comes out with the email address. And um, Leah took the lead and did um, took it a couple months ago and shared her story and that specifics about suicide. Yeah. Other questions? Was this helpful? Good. Yep. What's your mom's on So when I was in like middle school, or I'm sorry, elementary school, she was using like a cane and a walker. Um, and I think that with MS, and I have looked at this, um, comes depression. And so with um, her MS, she developed depression and there's a whole lot of other things that happened with it. But um, ultimately, you know, we think as a family, she um, just didn't feel like she could be a good mom and didn't want to be taken care of, um, you know, down the road uh, as her body deteriorated. So unfortunately, I want her here today, but I, I'm sure that she's dancing in heaven and um, with her people and um, one day we will reunite. So, yeah. Yes, so me and my sister Jacqueline, we were just talking about this, cope very differently. <laughs> you would think being only two years apart, no, very differently, where I've kind of taken the step and, you know, shared my story. Jacqueline has been very conservative about talking about it, although she has still worked through it, going to sandcastles and counseling, but we coped with it very differently and also in different stages of life. Um, being in middle school and elementary school. Yep, I had a lot of wonderful family support. So my mom's mom, my dad's mom, and my aunt um, all really stepped up. We had a, a lot of other immediate family that I'm very, very grateful for that helped us. Yes, yes, absolutely, yep. And, you know, and that's why I sometimes, you know, just because somebody has MS does not mean they're going to end up, you know, with my mom's situation. Um, there was a lot of other, you know, things going on with the depression and medication and counselors and yada, yada, yada. We still, you know, we found that her doctors weren't really communicating, which sometimes we even find today. Um, but, yeah, so it's, MS is, it's hard, yeah. Thank you. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. That's a great question. Um, okay. Well, this is what I would say. The, we have a rule. We have a couple of rules, but the ones like keep your hands to your own body are irrelevant. But the important ones are like the I pass rule. So, First thing, if somebody's resistant to joining our group, I will say, share the iPass rule. And that means that I can come in, they could come in to the first group and sit down and literally, we ask them to say their name, if, if that's possible, just share your name. Um, but they don't have to say anything. 
They can literally just come the whole time and pass, and that is perfectly 100% acceptable. No worries. So that helps a little when you want someone to try something that they don't have to go and talk or bare their soul. They just go, just go and try it. Then the second thing we'll say is try it three times. Like make a deal with them to try three times. And it kind of depends on age, I guess, a little bit. I've got, but with the teenagers especially, like th three sessions, give it a shot, see what you think, and then we'll sit down and have a conversation. And if this isn't a good fit for you, then we'll find something else. But usually by the time they get there twice, sometimes you go one time somewhere and you're like feel awkward and then you walk out and you feel awkward, it, whether it be counseling or therapy or anywhere new sometimes, you know. But then, you know, once you get to know kids and then people are happy to see you the next time and, you know, usually by three times they're kind of comfortable. And understanding they don't have to, you know, they're there participating. We know those kids are listening even if they're not talking and it's just, just being there can be really powerful. So those would be the things I would recommend. Um, if they are resistant. And then we have different programming. So the eight-week program is like a closed-ended, all-in-one program that you're going to get everything you need for grief. It's like our grief it's like our grief 101, right? So we're going to talk about what our goal is, is to educate about grief. No, no it's normal. You lo love and you lose, you go through it. This is what it comes, this is the stuff, this is the feelings. The, the phrase Leah was talking about, your feelings are never wrong, ever. What you do with them may or may not be. Your feelings are never wrong because you can't control your feelings. I can't say right now that I am never going to get mad again in my life. I'm not going to do it. I can't control that. I'm going to get mad. I, can't, I cannot control my feeling. So that feeling in itself is not wrong, right? I can't control it. What's important is what you do with that. So recognizing I'm getting mad, not taking it out on someone else, having healthy ways to release that frustration and anger, those are the really important components. So that's something we try to teach. We, in our bi-weekly program, we have a volcano room where they can come and rip up phone books, although there's not a whole lot of phone books out there anymore, so we're switching to try tissue paper. There's a punching bag. There's blocks that they build up and knock down. There's, like, different things that they can do to release the physical side of grief, and then we have a mindfulness component. So we talk about breathing and, you know, mindfulness and all the different elements that, because you can't go rip up a phone book when you're sitting in the middle of a classroom at school, right? But you can try some breathing techniques and different things like that. So we talk about those coping schools and teaching those coping skills. Then we do a lot of, you know, memorialization, honoring, remembering, telling of their story, and then how do we find support? So our eight-week program that we're starting in Rochester in January is working to, we're piloting it actually, so we're, it's working to kind of give all those tools in eight weeks. And it should be completely inclusive of everything that would give you a good toolbox full of stuff to go on with grief. Like we said, grief doesn't end. I think the goal of our program is to give a space to actually participate on that journey and learn about it and from it so that when it does come back up, whether it's the day you get married or the day you have a child, wherever, it could be years, you know it. There's a video from the Doggy Center and the little girl says, she's interviewed on, on 2020 when she was nine years old and she, her dad died and she's like, I just don't know how I'm ever, like how am I gonna get to my wedding? The nine-year-old, how am I gonna, how do I walk down the aisle without my father, this little nine-year-old? Well, they went back seven years later and interviewed her at 16 and she's like, I remember I just was so focused on that. Like I could not figure out how to like cope with that. She's like, but I learned the skills at the Doggy Center to know what to do. So the first thing she had was her eighth grade graduation. And she said, I knew on that day, because that was a big day for me, it was going to be hard. And I was going to really, it was a grief moment. So I planned ahead, and I got up in the morning. I danced, because dancing was her release. She said, I danced for two hours. I cried for 30 minutes. I took a shower. I got ready, and I had a great day. So, like, that's the key, right? Can we, like, it's okay to grieve. We're going to grieve. In, but what, how do we deal with it healthy in coping and honoring? So, does that make sense? It makes sense. Okay. 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 Um, I would call us and set up an appointment with Leah. And she'll do an intake with you. But, but I would, okay, I have been in this field for a long time. I would have them come. Counseling is wonderful. I am a counselor. <laughs> um, 
it sometimes depends on who the counselor is. You know, if you've ever had a counselor, some counselors are a good fit for people, other people are not as good of a fit, and if it's not like the right perfect fit, it may not like be a great place to be. And sometimes it's hard to talk to an adult, like a kid's just talking to an adult. Well, now they're gonna sit in a group with six to eight other kids who are their age, you know, and it just is a whole different experience. Right, it's when we do, and and you would think it's not like somebody said, "Oh my gosh, it must be so sad." You guys cry all the. We don't. There, there's not even that many tears to believe it or not, because this is their reality, right? They're just telling their story, and there's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of connection because now they're with other people who get it and who understand. So that creates that safety for them to be able to talk because they're with peers. Does that does that make sense? I would tell them give it a try. <laughs> give it a try, yeah. And, and then we have other things like camp, which is like a weekend. Awesome weekend. I've had people, I've had a family drop their <laughs> teenage son. <laughs> He's actually one of our volunteers now. <laughs> he came back years later. He, came, he spoke for us at one event. He's like, my mom dropped me off at camp. I was so mad at her the whole time. I was so mad at her. I did not want to go. I was livid. And when I got there... I realized that this was something different. And I, for the first time, I was with people who I felt safe enough to tell my story. And I told people I had just met things about my dad that I hadn't told my best friends who I knew for 10 years. And then and they went and proceeded to say that it just changed the trajectory of his life. Like, it just put him right back on the road. And now he came back to volunteer like six months ago. <laughs> it's fantastic. So, so we can help give it a shot. Yep. So that is going to be totally dependent upon what works for you. So there's no right or wrong. But I would not immediately remove everything and take it away and put it away because that is just, that's, that's kind of like a message like we can't deal with this, we can't cope with this. I would actually probably recommend having a conversation and sitting down and say, all right, I've been thinking about this. I'm looking at these pictures. I'm looking at this, that, and the other thing, and I don't know, I don't know how I feel about it or what to do about it. Or, or be honest, and I'm wondering what you guys feel. And see, do they like having them? Does it bring comfort? Does it not? Is there too many of them? Can we put them in one place? You, you can do anything that you want. And, I would, and may, it might be different depending on the person. Like one child might be like, yep, I don't want to look at them, and the other might be, I do. And then so is there a way you can do that? Can you do it in a bedroom or like... Minimize them. So kind of starting that conversation and, and just being honest, like this is hard and um, I've been thinking about this and I'm just really curious on what you're thinking. Oh. Yep. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I saw your hand up, so I'm happy to... Yeah, thank you, everybody.